Yes, we are okay. going. All right. Hello, my name is Stacy Krim, and I am here with David Gwynn, and today is Friday, February 8th. I'm speaking with Peggy and Mitch Matthews about Key Flag of Greensboro for Pride of the Community Oral History Project. Thank you for speaking with us today. Um, so to get us started, can you tell us a little bit about yourselves? Are you natives to the area? You want to tell first? I'm a native of South Carolina. Okay. Came to school in North Carolina. First job was in North Carolina. Met Mitch, been here ever since. So I've been in North Carolina really since 1966. And we've been in Greensboro since 1973. Three. Okay. How about you, Mitch? I am a native North Carolinian. I grew up in Davie County, the other side of Winter salem Very rural. Mm -hmm. uh, was born in the house that my <laughs> parents lived in at the time. I uh, got there before the doctor did. Mm -hmm. And uh, went to school at Catawba College in Salisbury. Uh, then we were both out and working in our careers before we met. And, um, but after it looked like our relationship could become some sort of a long-term thing, almost 47 years, <laughs> uh, we decided both that we should finish more education. So mm -hmm. I went to the Master's in Social Work program in Chapel Hill, and Peggy went to East Carolina for Master's in Sacred Music. Uh, when did you move to the triad area? Um, 1973. Okay. Um, so, how did you begin your involvement with PFLAG in Greensboro? Well, we did not know anything about PFLAG mm -hmm. uh, at all. Uh, now, I'm a social worker, and Peggy is a musician. We had lots of gay friends, but we had never heard of the, the organization. And our son went to the Savannah College of Art and Design, and people say, where's that? <laughs> <laughs> it's in Savannah. And um, uh, when he came home for Christmas break, winter break, he was not the same person who left us. Mm -hmm. He was irritable, um, didn't like anything. It was just really different and frustrating. And we, didn't, we knew something was going on, but we didn't know what or why. So it was a relief when he went back to school. <laughs> uh, when he came home for spring break, uh, I guess early April of 94, uh, it was kind of a repeat, and we still didn't have any idea. We did know that he had started drinking some, which was not... Very uncharacteristic. Yeah. Uh, and um, so a couple of weeks after he returned to school, we got a letter, a, a very long, long letter. lengthy letter, typewritten. And uh, he went into a lot of his personal history that he likes this, he doesn't like that. Um, he still has the same values and so on. He's still the same Paul, but he was gay. And he had always known he was different, even from a, from a very young age. And uh, we were really in shock because it was such a different thing. I mean, we didn't have a, a huge problem with his being gay. It was a different mindset, of course. Um, P. Flag says sometimes when um, when your straight child becomes your gay child, then there's a big transition. There's a lot of grief because your, your son or daughter may or may not get married, may or may not have children. Um, you know, it's very different. And when the child comes out of the, out of the closet, the parents go into the closet. <laughs> <laughs> because, you, you know, you start thinking, do the neighbors know? What do we tell people at the church? And um, we were, in some ways, we were very slow coming out of the closet ourselves. Um, now, I have no problem saying I have a gay son. Mm -hmm. And we're extremely proud of him, as well as our daughter. And um, I think, well, you know, it was such a 
different thing. Paul had been very active in the church and growing up, uh, even wrote a play for children that he produced. And uh, um, anyway, um, but it took us a long time. Uh, as soon as he wrote the letter, though, we had several tearful phone calls back and forth. And he um, first said, don't tell anybody. I thought, well, that's a burden to bear. You know, <laughs> you've got this huge change in a mindset, and, and you're just supposed to do. And um, so we were, we were in some shock, swat of a shock. Um, we would never, ever condemn him. But um, at one point he said he was prepared to come home, get his car, drive off, and never be seen again. And we assured him that he is our son and always would be, and there was nothing at all whatsoever that would make us stop loving him and uh, supporting him. And I could almost feel the sigh <laughs> over the telephone. Uh, those were difficult calls. But, but he had found <clears throat> PFLAG in Savannah and had, I think he had actually gotten in touch with the PFLAG person in Greensboro. So he told us how to contact her and where they met. And, and this was in April, so it took us until August to get there, but, <laughs> <laughs> but we went. And that was around 1994 or mm -hmm. so? Yep, mm -hmm. August 1994. And interestingly enough, um, I guess it was the next year, in the summer of 95, when I was in Savannah visiting him, uh, I went with him to a PFLAG meeting there. But <laughs> what was your first PFLAG meeting like? What was your impression when you walked in? What did you see? <clears throat> Well, we were headed out west friendly. At that time, we met in, at Friendship Friends Meeting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How's that for redundancy? <laughs> um, but it, uh, they had opened their doors to the group, and um, that was very nice. I don't remember how many people were there. It was not a big group. I would say eight, ten. Were there more than two people there? <laughs> I, I just remember... Retta being there, and the, oh, I can't think of what the lady's name was, but there could have been other people. <laughs> that was a long time ago now, but it wasn't a big crowd that night. Mm -hmm. well, when we were headed out West Friendly, I told Peggy, I said, going to this meeting yeah. means it's real. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we had reached a different level of acceptance, mm -hmm. and I had decided I was not going to say anything. <laughs> you can already tell. Well, that lasted about 30 seconds. <laughs> I fell apart. Yeah. I cried like a baby. Um, again, not that I loved Paul any less whatsoever, but we had to make an, a very large adaptation. Yeah, the, and the future that you think your child will have it's not going to be the future that's in your brain so that that takes some mind shifts but, um, but the people were wonderful mm -hmm. um, we started telling our story about Paul being a different person when he came home from break and then his letter and um, while we're on the phone the First, uh, this day we got the letter, uh, I said, would it be okay if we could call Don, who was our pastor at the time? And he very reluctantly agreed. Uh, I said, well, Paul, we, we need some help, too. Um, but Don had been with Paul for several years in youth work, and so after we thought about it, that was a little too close. So there was a retired minister uh, who had come back to Pleasant Garden and uh, is 
probably the most accepting person I have ever met. He was the pastor when we went there to that church in 1974. Peggy was hired as the music director, and in his sermons he would talk about our Jewish friends, our Buddhist friends. And he, we weren't used to that accepting language. I mean, it was good to hear. Um, and it felt freeing. And I knew that Marion Workman was his name, that he would do well. Um, but um, anyway, we decided we would call him instead. And so I called him and I said, we need some help. Can you come? And he said, I'll be there in 15 minutes. And, of course, he had no idea. He could tell from my voice that I was pretty upset. And um, he came in, and we sat down and fell apart. And he, his wife was a social worker as well, so he was kind of used, and a pastor, so he was very used to listening to people and responding in appropriate ways unlike some other pastors I've known. And um, he finally said, it took a tremendous amount of courage for Paul to tell you what he's told you, and he simply revealed a part of his personality that we didn't know about. And that he, uh, he valued and loved us enough to share this with us. Mm -hmm. He said, you know, some people never tell their parents anything like this, so... Okay. Yeah, and and when Marion said it, it just made so much sense. And it's like, this is a change, but it's not the end of somebody's life or a or relationship. The the certainly world. not the <laughs> end of a relationship. But um, he was very kind. And always, I never, I cannot imagine him ever rejecting anybody for any reason at all. And uh, we were close friends, and he and his wife are both gone now. Um, but he was the most accepting person I've ever known. And, um, but, you know, we continued to talk on the phone. Um, and then when Paul came, well, he started sending us literature. He said, read the underlined parts first. Yeah. He was <laughs> send books in the mail, and it, yeah. So, um, of course, when we went to our first people flag meeting, was he back in Savannah or soon to go? I don't I really remember. I think he was already back. Um, we've always met the third Tuesday of the month, and he was probably back in Savannah. But uh, I think he was real pleased that we went to people flag and, and we had missed. Huh? And still go. And still go. We have missed very few meetings. Mm -hmm. uh, I have missed several meetings due to health issues. Uh, and our daughter has some disabilities and requires help. So, you know, for different legitimate reasons we've missed. Mm -hmm. But most of the time we're always there. Mm -hmm. And a few years ago I became the facilitator for the meetings. And... Um, that was a good challenge. Sometimes you think, oh, how do I deal with this? <laughs> <laughs> but well, in PFLAG, you meet, like anywhere else, you meet lots of different kinds of people. And I saw some, particularly some men who came and they were so angry. You could just see the... Steam. <laughs> oh yeah, very angry. And... Um, and we, we always em emphasize this is your child. Your child didn't intentionally hurt you, uh, and your child is telling the truth. And, but then you occasionally have the ones who say, we're going to change this. And I can't count the number of young people who say, I can't go home. I can't go home on Christmas. I don't get birthday cards. When I call, they hang up on me. And in the early days, it was almost exclusively 
uh, gay people and straight allies. Um, and uh, now it's much more uh, transgender people. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but. Um, and it's more, um, more family oriented. It, it used to be that you know the gay people came, and sometimes the parent would come, but now the you know, the kids and the family members come. Yeah, uh, sometimes the gay person would say, "I thought about this a long time, and I've decided it, I want to come out to my parents, but I don't know how, and I need some guidance." Yeah. <laughs> and would say first, not at a holiday, <laughs> especially Mother's Day. <laughs> and if you're Never. in college and they're paying your bills, you might want to wait till you graduate. <laughs> yes, I felt a little guilty about that, but, but it's practical. Yeah. Uh, but I can't count the number of people who've been completely rejected, disinherited, whatever, by their families. Mm-hmm. And you think how, I just cannot imagine doing that. Or the, remember that there was a man who came for quite some time, and I can't remember his, his son had actually committed suicide or had attempted, and and he said that they he could not take his son like to his grandfather's house for holidays. Nobody in the family wanted anything to do with him. So I thought, what a waste. Um. So take you back to the 90s when you had just started in Peak Life. What were some of the issues the other parents or people who were attending the meetings were about? What were they talking about? Do you remember any specific issues? Uh, they would come in, like we did at first, fall apart. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, um, you know, we would just... We had given out phone numbers and we talked to people, and um, but it was pretty much a, pretty much the same, isn't it? Yeah, um, we try to, in some way, assure them that there is life after your kid comes out, mm-hmm. <laughs> and it can be good. Mm-hmm. Uh, and of course, a lot of that has to do, depend on. Depends on the parents' attitudes. Yeah. Once in a while, a parent will come in and say, I know he's gay, or I know she's lesbian, but I can't get him to tell me. <laughs> so. Yeah. Sometimes the parent has to just confront. Yeah. And some parents will say, I finally decided, David, are you gay? And they kind of push them uh, to tell you. and. I can see how some kids would think, oh, how did they know that? And still be reluctant to admit it. Um, but um, we've, we've had some people who were intent on changing their kid. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Well, some of them for religious reasons. Uh, it's very sad. We both have been quite involved in the church our whole lives. Which church? Which denomination? Well, we both grew up uh, Baptist. Baptist. Mm -hmm. But we've been Methodist for... Since 1974. Yeah. Long time. (laughs) And uh, I have trouble with almost all of the denominations because they pick on something... uh, That wasn't a good term. They identify something with which they strongly disagree. And that becomes their focus rather than it being about... Inclusion, love, acceptance. Yes. And, uh, of course, a lot of people say, well, my Bible says... And, of course, we all know what the Bible says. Nothing. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But, you know, the Bible was written a very long time ago in a very different culture. Um, And... And not in Elizabethan English either. Right. Um, I'm convinced that if that if somebody came to church that was a little different from the regular congregation, whatever whatever that might be, 
if they looked different in appearance, if there was some glaring thing that says, I'm gay, I think Jesus would meet them and say, come on, sit next to me, and let's have lunch together after the service. Of course, Jesus would not be wearing long robes either. He'd be dressed like we are uh, because he identified with the people there. He told stories that people understood because it was their culture. He talked about lands and um, uh, losing things. And growing crops. <laughs> growing crops. And uh, uh, he, may, he wanted people to understand, so he told them stories uh, related to things that they could understand, and it all made sense. Um, there are a lot of things I cannot understand, but I've decided I don't have to understand everything. Well, yeah, back to the um, how were things then as opposed to now. Over the years, there have been more people coming in saying, um, my child is transgender. I don't know how to handle this. I don't know what to do. And it sometimes it seems that maybe the gay gay issue is not as upsetting <laughs> to people um, maybe as saying my child is transgendered. Mm -hmm. So because they're similar but very different. Yeah. Um, so we, we, we have uh, a couple in PFLAG who have been very active. They came a few years after us, and they had an adult child who was transgendered, and they became very strongly involved with the local um, and state transgender support network. Um, they had five children. Some of them have completely yeah. rejected their Sibling. sister, <laughs> yeah. who used to be a brother, uh, as well as the parents because of their acceptance of their sister. Um, some won't talk to them because they're following evil ways or something. And, um, it's very, very sad. Um, There are, there are a lot of, I understand it's a shock. It's not a, at all like you had anticipated, but it's what is real. And as people who want to love our families and get along and so be supportive, we just have to look at the world in a different way. But to, to me, that, that's the biggest difference. You know, we've moved from just supporting oh, yeah. gay people and parents of gay children. We've moved more into the transgender. And, and there are so many different labels now. I can't keep up with them all. Um, we, we do have trouble with our pronouns sometimes. <laughs> and I have to stop and think, okay, this is... Him, him, okay. But when did you start seeing um, more families entering PFLAG with uh, transgender children? Probably three years ago. Three years ago, that recent? Well, I think it was, well, yeah, there, there have been more. Yeah, last month, I think we had three new families um, that might have been a parent and a child, or a family, um, but three new uh, groups, uh, they were all trans dealing with transgender issues, and I think there was, I don't think there was any brand new gay person at all. So that's a very interesting change. And you mentioned that you have people, families coming in that have adult children, and I presume young children as well. And as a facilitator, could you talk a bit about the differences there may be when you have a family who's dealing with a young trans or possibly gay child versus a, an adult child well, coming out? 
Um, children cannot come to the meeting if they're under 18 mm -hmm. and not accompanied by a parent. Mm -hmm. Because there are groups for... Mm -hmm. um, yeah, um, what was that group, Pauline? Glass. Oh gosh, gay and lesbian support, support services, something. or something like that. And I believe that is one thing that mm -hmm. why Paul Matthews is still alive. Mm -hmm. He was so worried and so still figuring it all out that um, Glass was a tremendous help to him. Um, I think, um, well, they, we do have some families who come with younger children who kind of stay over the, in the other part of the room, um, but, um, and we have some families where both parents come, that's really nice. Um, I, I'm not really sure. Now, the couple Peggy talked about, they've been uh, involved probably 20 years. Um, but I, I guess that was about the first one. Mm -hmm. that the first one I remember. Um, who was talking about transgender issues. But now most of the new people mm -hmm. are dealing with transgender issues and uh, children are coming out earlier and earlier and earlier. Mm -hmm. um, we've heard stories about my three-year-old says, I'm a girl. Why are you giving me that, these cowboy boots or whatever? And uh, I, I think there are some people who would say, oh, they're just too young to know what it, to know about themselves. And it's just a phase and on and on. Children know. Um, sure, there are phases that all kids go through, you know, they like this kind of music and not that kind of music, or this style and not that style, uh, but when you're talking about personhood and sexuality, it's usually not a phase. Um, and it is hard to understand how somebody who's three years old knows that much about. But then when, when people tell you, I've always known my earliest memories, I knew I was different. Not, I couldn't really explain what it was, but I knew that something was not like everybody else. Um, so when you were talking about the parents who were coming to these meetings and thinking how they were going to change their child's identity and you brought up religion as one of the issues. What were some of the other issues parents would try to change their children's identity? <clears throat> well, I think there are some parents who have um, a vision of what their child is going to be as an adult. And it might have to do with career choices. Um, and, you know, if they're transgender, maybe that career choice is not going to be as easy um, to enter. Um, there are, we know some people who at a meeting or other certain designated areas, they are in their element. They present themselves as, uh, as female or male but when they go back home, when they go to work the next day, uh, they're back to uh, their birth gender. Mm -hmm. And it makes me feel really sad. Uh, we've had some, we had a, a kind of a, well, we do uh, support, which is my strongest thing about PFLAG. That's, that's what people need. Um, but we do um, education as well as, as advocacy. Several of us have spoken to other groups. Um, 
we used to get a lot of requests from the universities uh, wanting us to uh, talk about it. And um, I've lost my train of thought. What'd you do with it? <laughs> <laughs> well, to follow up, um, so can you give some examples of the of where you've presented at and what you presented on and the reception of, of what you were presenting on? Okay. Uh, lots of university classes. Mm -hmm. uh, usually... You've been over here several times, haven't you? Uh, oh, yeah. An A&T. And, yeah. Um, Guilford College, Greensboro College. I don't think I've been to Bennett. Um, but um, it's exciting to be around young people who are eager to learn <laughs> and they're not setting their ways already. Uh, and many of them are not. I'm sorry. This is not really <laughs> yeah. um, Any community groups? I think there are, are you know, when, the, when it maybe it's have about human behavior and social environment kind of class. Mm -hmm. You know, it goes in all kinds of directions. If there's a student who is interested or dealing with um, sexuality issues, it's a real convenient way to share information with their other classmates by having this expert kind of person <laughs> come and talk about it in a non-biased way. And um, Maybe, uh, and sometimes the professor will say, you can invite a guest or you can present yourself, whatever, you know. And so a lot of them would choose to invite a guest. Um, and I think that would be a good way for a student to test the waters. Mm -hmm. You know, if the students say, oh, no, we don't want to hear another thing like that. Um, they will know, well, I don't guess this is a place I can come out safely in. Um, that went back to our son, one of safety, personal safety, was one of my greatest concerns. And um, because, well, I know gay people are still harassed and bullied and um, physically attacked. It doesn't seem, well, I don't know. Uh, maybe we just hear about it less. Um, but um, there is a whole lot of violence out there. She asked if you had presented to any community groups. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, we uh, Different ones of us have gone to church groups, school groups. You have to be really careful in public schools. Um, well, you know, it seems unnecessary, but I also understand why, it's, why it is necessary to get parental permission for them to hear this particular presentation uh, because of the reaction of some parents. Uh, uh, civic groups, um, I'm trying to remember, there was a group we met at the hospice building, but it wasn't about death and dying. It was uh, it was a mixed group of interested people, and um, when, when you begin to hear people say it's broadened by thinking, uh, I had to challenge some of the things I was told as a child. You know, you're make, beginning to make a difference. Uh, some people very strongly wrestle with religious uh, issues and um, I mean they their entire lives they have been said the Bible is true every word of it uh, and God has not changed um, but then the Bible was written even though it may have been well even though it was inspired by God, it was written down by human beings who sometimes misunderstand. Imagine. <laughs> and, uh, um, and then just 
errors in uh, copying copying all those manuscripts. Oh gosh, so I can't write. <laughs> would you say that, um, in, especially in the early meetings, that religion was a big stumbling block for a lot of the families? Coming yes, in? yes, it still is for some families. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have a family who their career has been missionaries in another country. And I don't know how many children they have, but the oldest son came out. And so the father was really upset about that. So anyway, the mother and the son came home to the United States for a furlough. Uh, Sadly, that uh, family is not together anymore. Uh, and the, the man feels that the mother has just gone, you know, off the deep end. But she is a very supportive person and she keeps t- saying how much she has learned in the last year. Mm-hmm. Um, Do you, does G- does uh, PFLAG work with a network of religious organizations in the area to help the LGBT community or help parents? Uh, Not as a a network. Um, We know of certain congregations that are welcoming and accepting. Um, And so we would never... Oh, yeah, one thing is that we do not promote any religious uh, group. for one thing, our tax status <laughs> is important, and so we do not um, advocate any particular religious uh, thinking, uh, nor do we uh, support any particular political figure. Uh, if people raise questions about, well, what, is, what about so-and-so? Does he or she support this and that and the other? Uh, you know, we would not ever say, vote for this person uh, again, um, it wouldn't be appropriate, uh, and it does have something to do with our uh, tax uh, status. Um, there are there are people who come in the beginning and they're very active, and then they reach some point of equanimity, I guess, and they they're okay with things. Uh, so they may not come now, or they may come very rarely. Um, and that's okay. And that's okay. Um, since we've been involved with the United Methodist Church for a lot of years now, um, you may know that the United Methodist Church has struggled with this issue for a long time, and they're supposed to come out sometime in the spring or summer with a definitive statement. Mm-hmm. And um, people have said it will split the church. That's not the worst thing that could happen. Uh, that's one way that we separate the sheep from the goats. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's one way that the gospel can be shared with different people right. who can. Oh, but we we also have um, some Jewish people involved mm-hmm. oh, yeah. at this point in time. So it's not just you know Protestants. And, mm-hmm. Right. Oh yeah, we have Catholic people, and, mm-hmm. um, and we meet in a Baptist church, right? Yeah, the uh, College Park Baptist yes. right. across the street. It seems yes. so ironic that a Baptist church would be allowing this this renegade group to meet there. <laughs> but the pastor, for many years, has been a very strong advocate. And a lot of gay people attend that church mm-hmm. because it's accepting, uh, non-condemning. Mm-hmm. Uh, some of the uh, people have, some of the gay people have been involved in leadership kinds of, you know, activities. Mm-hmm. So it's a very refreshing mm-hmm. sign, I think. Um, you brought up, of course, the political standpoint that the organization cannot have. But right. North Carolina obviously has made sexual identity and gender identity very political. So can you yes. speak about what families were experiencing during 
the, the debate for gay marriage or HB2, the sorts of issues families were bringing to meetings at Peace Well, <clears throat> uh, some of our people uh, go to uh, Legislative Day in Raleigh. Uh, they often have appointments prearranged with certain legislators, well, the ones from our district. Um, and, um, you know, we've done a little bit of that before. Um, I don't think it's my strong point, um, but uh, it is important. I think we've all made phone calls and sent emails. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but um, uh, it, it's a Im very important thing to do, and if we don't say anything, then they'll do anything. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I think most politicians get into office thinking that everybody else believes the same thing they do. And they're very, very short-sighted if they do believe that. Um, and like a lot of us, they think their way is the only way, the only right way. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, in the United States, we believe that everybody has an equal opportunity to voice themselves, uh, uh, express their feelings, uh, to fight and vote for or against mm -hmm. uh, their feeling, you know, their values. Um, you know, it, you know, when we have another major shooting of a gay bar or, um, it stirs emotions within us and we think something has to be done. But it's such a huge problem some of it is so insidious that it, it, you don't know about it until it happens. Well, it's kind uh. of the same thing with the school shootings and um, any kind of hate crime. Mm -hmm. Do you have parents who come to meetings fearing for their children after all of these events? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, Linda, uh, the you talked with, I don't know if you met her personally. I don't know about her personally. Uh, well, she and her husband had two ch children, two, both sons, and their younger son came out when he was 13. And I think at first it was like, really? I mean, he's so young. And, but he was very committed and persistent, saying, this is who I am. So as their son went through bullying and being treated differently by teachers and um, they become, became very, very strong advocates in the schools. Um, no student, whatever they are, should ever be fearful uh, for their safety um, at a public school. Well, any school. <laughs> uh, but. Um, were incidents of bullying reported frequently in P flag meetings for the, for the parents who had um, children that were out? Say that again. Were incidences of bullying uh, common in where they talked about in meetings? Oh yeah. P flag. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, and. In years past, thank goodness it's not this way now, at least openly, uh, but there are some teachers or even officials in schools who would say, they're gay, that's what you expect. Yeah. They're different. You expect to be treated differently. Well, not maybe differently, but not violently. Um, Uh, but yeah, yeah, a lot of times parents come and express their fear for their children. Mm -hmm. Or they give examples of what have happened. Mm -hmm. um. <clears throat> and I've seen, I've taught children over the years that I would think, I wish I could tell you to come back and talk to me when you get it all figured out mm -hmm. and see if my right. instincts were correct. 
So you first are bullying for the children, but you also mentioned when your son was coming out that you were concerned about how other people in your life would, what their impression would be knowing you had a gay son. Um, did you have any parents talk about being bullied or having negative um, encounters once their children were out and other people knew about that? I don't remember a specific example. I do know that some parents have said people at work treated them differently because they have a gay kid. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's or hard for Family me. members did yeah. not, you know, did not treat them the same after the news came out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what would you, since your time starting with PFLAG to now, how would you say the climate for the LGBT community has changed in the Greensboro area? Well, it has changed mostly for the better, but it doesn't mean that it's, the bad stuff is gone. Mm -hmm. It's just become more underground, I guess. Um, and, you know, when officials refused to label something as a hate crime, it would just, I mean, that goes against getting help for, uh, to protect uh, LGBT kids. Uh, we had um, a, co a gay couple, male, who came to some meetings, this was a long time ago, and um, one of them was in the healthcare industry, and um, his work was fine, got along well with patients and whatever. Uh, that person chose to put a vanity license plate on the front of his um, car that said Bob and Joe or whatever. And I don't know what else it had, but that man was fired the next day. And you think, that had nothing to do with the quality of his work um, or the care the people received. Mm -hmm. But it's this impression that somehow this person is, a, is no longer qualified or to be trusted or... <sighs> I can understand why it may be hard to get let scout leaders, coaches for yeah. sports, um, because sometimes, you know, somebody will take an innocent, uh, actually a pat on the shoulder as some kind of sexual thing and you think, give me a break. Uh, I mean, you know, coaches have, I don't want to say intimate, but a close relationship with players uh, because they've, they've had to work with them a long time. Sometimes they've been able to help this kid develop skills he didn't know he could had, and um, so they, they've demonstrated that they really care about the kids. But sometimes somebody can say, oh, you know how that coach is. And he's like, what? Mm -hmm. um, it's very sad. Mm -hmm. So in your time as a facilitator, um, what are some of the most <coughs> poignant or emotional moments that you've had to work through with groups? Well, I think there's some who really don't like to hear what they're told. And so they keep kind of pushing what they thought was right before. Um, they're just not, they're not ready to accept it. Uh, and that's difficult. Uh, recently, there was a mother and a transgender son 
who were there and even though questions were directed at the son, the mother always answered them. And uh, I'm no longer facilitating. Mm -hmm. um, I've had a lot of issues with my back. and um, But it was frustrating that the woman would not allow her son to... Um, so finally I called the young man's name and I said, Bill, tell us about blah, blah, blah. And the mom started talking. I said, just a minute. And I don't think she really understood. <laughs> and, uh, but throughout the entire meeting, she kept saying, well, I don't have a problem with it. Well, if you have to tell me that you don't have a problem with it, you have a problem, you have a problem with it, usually. Um, and how old was the son, approximately? High school, okay. um, maybe 11th, 12th grade. Oh yeah, he's getting ready to go to college, so mm -hmm. be graduating real soon. Did he ever get a chance to talk? <laughs> <laughs> um, not really. Uh, I think if I could do it over, I would have said, Mom, I really appreciate your feelings about this, and I know you have a lot you want to say, Right now, we'd like to hear from Bill uh, about his feelings or whatever. Um, when it is interesting, we've had some families with transgender children, and in the beginning, I can remember one in particular who continued to look female for a very long time. Um, dress, hair, all that. Uh, but then, I don't know, there were some months when maybe we were that out or whatever, and months when uh, the child began uh, chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. And you thought, oh, this is a different person. <laughs> uh, and and um, you think, all oh, right. You're getting there. Mm -hmm. But to me, the most touching um, have been, you know, when the kids come in and say, my family told me not to come back. Or, or I, I can see them, they say, we're not going to talk about it. Mm -hmm. don't, don't mention that. Don't bring that up. No, don't bring your friend to the family mm -hmm. Christmas party or whatever. You're welcome, but right. the other person's not. And what advice do you give to the young people who have to deal with that? Because you're sort of your parents after a passion yeah. with some of these children. <laughs> I'd like to adopt them. But <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, I guess sometimes we say, well, some parents take longer to accept and see that this is a real change, so don't give up on them. Um, I had written up some ideas about things we've done. We used to spend a lot of time with a, a young gay person who's wanting to come out but doesn't know how to do it, and you know, whether a letter, a telephone call, in person, whatever. And um, no matter how carefully the kid plans, even with our support, you don't know really how they're going to react. Yeah. Uh, you, might, you might think your parents really, really love you and they'll just support you no matter what, but they haven't ever dealt with a gay issue before. Mm -hmm. And so they may not react the way you anticipate. Um, uh, I'm sorry, An another biggie is when your spouse comes out as gay or transgendered and and it's like I don't know what to do. <laughs> what do I do? How you know, how do I deal with this? Um, and you've had families with that happening at, at Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. A lot. Can you talk a bit about that? How that affects the family? Well <clears throat> you talk about it. Well, sometimes the spouse says, well, I'm going to stay, you know, I, I'm married 
to this person because I love the person. And I'm going to stay in this marriage no matter what. And I guess for the time being, that's... Uh, maybe that gives you something to hang on to, but uh, it doesn't always last. <laughs> and it doesn't seem like too many of those have... I mean, they would come for a while, and then you didn't see them anymore. Right. So they didn't really stay long-term, so some of them, we don't know what happened. But, but yeah, that's was always a tearjerker. <laughs> well, I've been married to this person for these years, and but, but then once in a while you, you meet these people who are... Uh, transgendered and they get married and they decide to have a baby and <laughs> and they do <laughs> that you know they have a, a sperm well, where, where did you find the sperm donor on the internet <laughs> <laughs> yeah and of course a lot of people who do that are very selective oh, of course they should be yeah. very selective It's not as easy to be selective in the natural way. <laughs> but, you know, for, for all the sad stories, then once in a while we have some really happy endings. Right. What's uh, one of the happiest endings you remember from working with Peace Life? Well, I think it's like a, a, the couple, m couples that Peggy has mentioned, they decide they're going to stay together even though their relationship is changing. Um, they may not really be able to stay together, but they can work it out to have a friendly relationship. They have kids together, they have grandchildren maybe. Um, and of course, the, most spouses hearing this news are gonna be very hurt, angry, but they, you know, invested so many years uh, in that relationship. So fortunately, some are able to say, well, I mean, there, we know some who have holiday events and the former spouse comes and the new spouse comes and, and you think, isn't that great? <laughs> So you brought a sheet with some things you wanted to talk oh, about? Oh, well, these were just some things. Yeah, is there anything um, there you'd like to, to mention? Well, um, a woman named Jean Manford uh, marched with her son in a, a pride parade in New York City in 1972. And she had a big cardboard sign that said, Parents, unite for your kids, for your gay kids, or something like that. And uh, so... You know, it started as a very tiny group. Uh, and now there are chapters all over the United States and other places as well. Um, and when people was, like marches in the Gay Pride March, mm -hmm. they get cheered. <laughs> yeah, when people like is there, you know, we right. get uh, cheered because these people support us. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, there was a uh, peace like chapter in Winston Salem before there was in Greensboro. Mm -hmm. A woman named Retta Gray uh, had been living in Winston Salem, and so uh, she had moved to Greensboro and wanted to start a group here. So she had gone to Winston Salem and learned some things over there, mm -hmm. and um, so she started. I, I don't know how she contacted other people. Um, but of course, she you know she had connections with other um, women, and so uh, she was the facilitator for the first uh, few years. Um, sometimes the meetings were very small, you know, five or six people. Occasionally, it might be as many as twenty. Uh, somewhere, it's usually around ten each or twelve, mm -hmm. um, uh, and. Um, 
after we were formalized as a PFLAG chapter, then we uh, started um, asking people to pay dues. Uh, we do not make anybody leave who doesn't want to pay dues. Mm -hmm. um, we feel if you're really invested, you're going to pay dues uh, because of the benefit you feel. But uh, for whatever reason, some people choose not to do that, but we nev would never want them to stop coming just on the basis of that. Um, and uh, we, I remember we gave a fellowship and a friendship friends meeting, $100 a year to help with utilities uh, and all. Um, um, oh, and Peggy mentioned too that sometimes uh, the kid has tried so hard and then they finally tell their parents and they say, we knew that already. Yeah. <laughs> We're just waiting for you to tell us. And uh, so, you know, if a parent is really paying attention, sometimes there are signals. I guess we weren't paying attention. <laughs> I don't know. Um, oh, yeah. There was a young man that we spent a lot of time helping him get ready to come out to his family. But he would go back home to his hometown and go to church with his family. And whatever time of the year it was, uh, even if it was a biggie like Christmas or Easter, the sermon happened to be on homosexuality. And you think, that doesn't make sense. But because he was in the congregation, the speaking person decided to... Uh, and you think, that's just not appropriate. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and then some people uh, who are coming out have are married, have been married, uh, and sometimes they can deal with their spouse, and then they figure out, how do we tell the children? Um, and sometimes kids will be told you have two mommies or two daddies or whatever. Um, uh, and then, well, you know, you think theoretically, okay, we can work on this, it'll work out. But then maybe when you meet the new partner of your former spouse, it might not go down so well. <laughs> So, um, you, uh, sometimes meetings are very emotional. Um, we cry a lot, we laugh a lot. Um, and there's some gay couples who have been together. 20 years. As long as we have. <laughs> Yeah, we, um, whoever is a facilitator explains that, you know, um, this is a place where you can find support and encouragement. You can ask questions. Any question is okay. Uh, but we respect everybody. And sometimes... And confidentiality is, is stressed. Very important. Very important. You know, I went to the people like, and guess what? You know who I saw over there? Your office mate. Um, uh, we used to have a lending library uh, of books. Um, and videos. And videos. Um, now, we don't really pursue that much because people don't read books anymore. <laughs> I'm really, I like to hold the book. <laughs> I know I'm really old-fashioned. Um, uh, sometimes we will have a program at our meeting. We might have an attorney yeah. who will come and uh, who has experience working with um, especially transgender people. Mm -hmm. um, um, like one of the transgender people who is a student on this campus uh, has changed his name um, to a masculine name. And, uh, but, you know, there are a lot of legal 
issues. And, and you know, this new thing about serving in the military. <laughs> You want to just say, can't we all just get along? (laughs) Can't we all just get along? Well, on that note, as we wrap up the oral history, is there anything you want to say um, about your time with Key Flag, or for the record, about being parents to an LGBT child that we we haven't spoken about? Well, now, we just know it. It's Paul, and he has a partner, and they're planning to be married uh, sometime in 2020. And um, it just seems normal. (laughs) Uh, Paul had brought, when he was in school, uh, and maybe a little when he first started his career, he would bring a boyfriend home. And um, uh, they didn't last very long. I mean, he needed to do all that exploration, and we needed it too. Um, But um, sometimes we will have a program on a specific thing. We've had attorneys to talk about legal uh, legislation that's proposed and how it might affect people. And um, you know, we've known people who have been together for years and years and years and years. And then they're dying in the hospital, oh, yeah. and their family will not allow their partner to be around. I mean, that is one of the most hurtful things I can imagine. And you think how close they have been together, and and how is that going to detract from the parents? To oh well, sometimes we have uh, films. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we have, uh, there's some excellent videos out there. And of course, we hardly ever go to movies, but you know, movies include a lot more about sexuality issues mm-hmm. today than they used to. Right. Uh, you know, uh, Lucy and Desi slept in different beds. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we've covered We've covered a lot of territory. Mm -hmm. So thank you for speaking with us today. You're welcome. It has certainly been our pleasure to do this. Well, I appreciate it. And this is kind of a personal thing, but the, um, the guy,